Thanks, Rob. Thanks, everybody, for uh, coming this morning. I really appreciate that. Uh, I'm here to tell you a, a story this morning, and it's a love story, which I'm sure you guys were really excited to hear on a Friday morning, a love story. And uh, better yet, it's a love story about marshmallows, uh, because that's what we sell at Wonder Maid. We sell marshmallows. And I'm really excited to tell you about that. Uh, sh quick show of hands. How many of you guys like marshmallows? Great. I, I'm hoping that uh, most of you are being honest and not just feeling social pressure. Uh, but if not, I'll convert you by the end of this. Uh, you know, that's about where I was two years ago. I liked marshmallows. Marshmallows were this thing that I had a pleasant sense of, a pleasant feeling of. And something happened that totally uh, shifted my perspective. And that's what I want to tell you about. Um, let me slide advance here. Uh, because every good marshmallow starts somewhere. So let me tell you about our start. Uh, my wife and I, for Christmas every year, have this struggle. What do, you, do, what do we get each other? You know, everyone in here, I'm sure, goes through that. There's someone you love, and you try to capture all that love into a little gift that has a bow on top. And it's a recipe for uh, failure, or at least the fear of failure, if you're me. So, uh, man, anxiety was running high. And to complicate matters further, for my wife and I, the way we do Christmas gifts is we had this ridiculously low dollar amount to force us to be more creative, like we needed the extra pressure. So $60 was the cap for all the presents, including the ones from our kids. So I'm driving around, oh man, how am I going to do this? What am I going to do? And on NPR, they had this nutritional expert talking about how great candy was, more or less. At least that's what I remember. Uh, and what he was saying is that uh, sweets in small packages are great. Um, for all these reasons, and I, I was so intrigued and I was so motivated, and because I'm an obsessive sort of person, I went home and spent way too much time researching candy and what it takes to make candy. And along the way, I just thought, man, this is really interesting, and I have everything I need except for one thing, a candy thermometer. Well, those are actually, uh, first, they exist. I didn't even know that. Um, and they're only like $10. So I thought, well, $10 is less than 60 This could be my big win. So I went and picked marshmallows, just kind of on a lark. That was the first type of candy we would make. And for my wife, for Christmas, as an I love you, I gave her a candy thermometer, and I gave her a recipe for marshmallows. Yeah, you should have seen her face when she opened it. She was like, a thermometer. OK, thanks. I'm like, no, no, it's for marshmallows. This is going to be great. Uh, well. We made them a couple days later, and there was a problem. And the problem wasn't the marshmallows. The marshmallows were insanely good. Uh, it was actually passion fruit is the first type we made. Uh, they, were, they were truly incredible. But the problem was we realized we had been shortchanged our whole lives. Somebody had lied to me and told me that the thing I bought at a store was a real marshmallow, when in fact, that was a marginal experience at best. You know, it'd be like your whole life uh, thinking that the best taco you could get was Taco Bell. Man. You hit Mexico and a street taco vendor, and your mind is shattered, especially if you're me. So we thought, what in the world? We've been deprived, so we, we made more. And because it's hard to make a single marshmallow, you kind of have to make them by the hundreds. And we don't want to eat 100 marshmallows every time. We started sharing them with friends. That's what you do when you have something that you love. So we would give these marshmallows to our friends. And our friends would say, give us more, please. Uh, and they would say, make this type and make this type. And then along the way, they would say, well, could you make, um, make some so that I could give them as a gift to my kid's teacher or to my whoever. And so we started um, fulfilling those orders. And really, the question came up, well, what would it take for us to take this idea, this hobby, this thing that we're kind of doing and turn it into something uh, that was viable, maybe as a business, maybe as something that we could do even even larger. And that's, uh, that was sort of our million dollar um, question that fortunately did not actually require a million dollars. Uh, otherwise, I would not be here right now. And uh, 
so we, we had that question, and it led us to um, what I want to talk about here, uh, which is how do you sell a marshmallow? That's right. Very practical for all of you. Don't go and start your own marshmallow company because of this. But uh, I'm going to teach you how you sell a marshmallow. And there's two steps, and they actually relate. Uh, you can do this math and just replace the word marshmallow everywhere with whatever it is you do. Um, so first, you've got to make a marshmallow worth selling. Right? That makes sense. However, I spent 10 years hearing things that were the opposite of it. Because for 10 years, I had other companies, other business ventures that I've tried. I, you know, I had a design shop in Orlando for years. And all the advice I ever had told me to focus on markets. I always said, you know, what, are you going to be a high volume? Are you going to aim for the high end of the market? Are you going to aim for this niche or, or that niche? And people always consulted and directed me towards really focusing on a market-driven approach. And, you know, ostensibly, I get markets are made up of people, and you can do that math. But there's a, there's a huge divider between the two um, because when people tell you to divide the markets, really there's actually only two markets, and they're more about you than about the person that you're, you're selling to. So there's two markets. There are the people who are in something to make a buck. And there's nothing wrong with that. I don't want to demean the value of a dollar. Uh, but that's one of the markets. The other market is there's someone who is trying to make something for someone of value. And it's really the perspective on you. And we had to make the decision, do we want to be the people who make a buck off of marshmallows? Well, you know, there's people who do that. And honestly, the marshmallows aren't very good. Um, so we decided that, that we wanted to aim for people. We wanted to provide something of value. Uh, instead of making money off of marshmallows, we wanted to make marshmallows that were worth money. And again, it's just a twist, but uh, man, it was a total recalibration in the way we were going to start everything. And so the second step that you need to do in order to sell a marshmallow is you got to spend time on the front end. Man, I want to tell you, we spent thousands of hours before we ever sold a marshmallow figuring out how to do this. We have cooked, we have 50 recipes that I am so excited about, these flavors that would just knock your socks off if you're wearing socks. And uh, we love those, but we only sell six flavors at a time. And in order to get to those 50, actually, man, we had to try so many permutations. We had to find how to do something great by working our way through bad and good and better than good. Um, and every one of those really great recipes, man, the ingredients. I can tell you so much about different gelatins right now. I can talk for a while. Yeah, which that's actually my next point. Um, uh, I could talk to you about the difference between cinnamon uh, all over the world and cinnamon here, which is actually a different tree. It's a cassia tree, and, and we just get to label it that way. But it really matters because one tastes different than the other. One works differently. And, man, we had to investigate and research and toil because we wanted to do something that was exceptional, and it takes time on the front end. You know, the easiest way to see that, any, uh, most of us probably have iPhones in our pockets, and if you take that out, the amount of work that went in on the front end so that every person, my mom can use an iPhone without having to sweat it um, because they did their work on the front end. You know, I was, at, uh, I was at my church the other night and the pastor said that we want to raise the bar for leadership so that we can lower the bar for participation. That's why you have to do the work on the front end um, because we wanted to raise the bar on the quality of our marshmallows to, so that every single person would enjoy them, even the person who doesn't like marshmallows or who thinks that they don't like them. Because if we do something that's truly exceptional, then there's no barrier to entry. But it takes time, a lot of time. And you've got to decide to do that on the front end of things. This is what they look like. Um, but I'm not sure if you can see that. Uh, and you know, we spend the time not just on making them, but on photographing them, on sourcing the ingredients we use for them, and on thinking on every single detail um, that goes into the experience of eating one of our marshmallows. And so the third thing, um, the third thing that you need to do in order to sell a marshmallow is be in the people business. Uh, you know, Howard Schultz from Starbucks always talked about how um, we're a people business that sells coffee, not a coffee business that deals with people. Uh, that's the deal for us. Um, we make marshmallows, but we make them for people. The reason we started this is because we realized that there was a deficiency. There was a void in our lives that only marshmallows could fill. Um, and I would wager, uh, though many of you have probably not had these yet, 
that that void is there for you too. We keep discovering that every time we hear from, um, from a customer, we realize that there's truth in that. You know, the phone number on our website, you, if you go to wondermade.com and you see the number and you call it, you're calling my phone right here, uh, which has um, lots of great things about it. I got a phone call at 11 the other night from someone uh, at night, and I was sitting on my couch, and I answered it, and, uh, and it was this woman who just wanted to call and tell me how much her daughter loved Wonder Made marshmallows, uh, which was so cool, and it was like a 20-minute conversation. I, I'm not sure she thought I was going to answer. I'm guessing not because it was 11, so I don't think she was prepared for the phone call, um, but we talk, talked for 20 minutes. Her daughter got them as a gift, and it was just this incredible act of love and she was so excited that she told her mom and her mom was so enthused that she went to our site she got our phone number and she called me to tell me which was awesome uh, and especially awesome because that's what we're about we're about um, you know it says in our box bringing a little bit of joy to the world um, and and the way we deliver that is through marshmallows sure uh, but in and of themselves, they don't do anything unless someone's eating them, unless someone's experiencing them. So you've got to make sure that you don't ever forget, and that's what we've had to work on, that we don't ever forget that we are ultimately in the people business. Um, it's the most important thing. And I love those phone calls, though um, I'm not inviting all of you to call me at 11. Uh, if you want to talk to me, you can just do that afterwards. Um, so the second big deal is you've got to make a marshmallow worth selling. Uh, the second side of it, though, is you've got to tell a story. You know, I told you our story, how we started it at the beginning. And that's because I know my own story. Hopefully you know your own story. You can't tell a story if you don't know it. Um, but the trick, even if you know your own story, is you can't tell it if you're not there. I can't be every single place that sells a Wonder Made Marshmallow, as much as I might like to be. And I can't say, wait a minute, wait a minute, let me tell you about this thing. You've got to try it. Um, it's just not possible. So I've got to figure out a way for that story to get told without me. And I could, you know, print that whole thing on the back of every box. I'm sure you guys have all seen packaging that does that. And, uh, you know, that just seems a little heavy-handed. And then I'm asking you to stand there for three minutes and read something in seven-point type, which would be a little bit mean and cruel. So what we tried to do is figure out how do we tell our story even if I'm not there. So we tried to distill it. You know, again, we spent so much time on the front end thinking about this. And we tried to distill it so that the Wonder Maid story is really two things. First, that marshmallows should be awesome and fun, really critical. Um, and secondly, that they are best enjoyed together. That it's really, you know, in our story, this is something I gave to my wife. This is something we shared with our friends. This is always something that we have done um, really communally. And that's why the boxes are, are sized the way that they are. It's not a single serving. It's a us-sized serving, although I confess many, many times I have downed the whole box on my own. Uh, so a little honesty there. But, you know, we decided that we were going to aim for those two elements of story that we wanted people to always get. Um, and then the question became, how do we tell that? Uh, you know, it took us a long time to figure out that was the story we wanted to tell. And that was okay because one of the um, critical things to telling a story is remembering that preparation communicates value. You've got to be able to see that, mind you. If it's preparation that's not visible, uh, it's going to be squandered. But we were okay spending all this time preparing for things because we wanted people to realize how important we think that they are. We wanted people to realize how important we think these marshmallows, how great we think they are. So we took that story, we took our idea, and we decided we needed to bring on people who were better at storytelling than us to help us. You know, I'd, I'd done branding and, and design work, but there are people who are better than me, and this was an opportunity to bring someone in with an outside perspective to help. So we just thought, man, who is the best, who would be the best people we could bring in? And we didn't think that long, and we ended up calling this company out of Philadelphia, the Heads of State, incredible design firm. I would encourage you to go look up their work. And what makes them so incredible is how well they are able to take uh, an emotion or a narrative and capture it in something visual. Um, and so we called them, and I left them a message. Hey, I'm Nathan. I'm starting a marshmallow company, and I'm hoping that you can help us with the branding. Call me back. This is going to be awesome. And, and they did. And they were like, wait, a, a marshmallow company? Could you rewind that a little bit? Because we don't know what that is. 
Um, but they were so excited, and, uh, and they worked alongside us to help us figure out what it would be like to deliver that story, not just to deliver the marshmallow, but to deliver our story on a box, um, in a retail experience, in a logo, in a, on a website. And then we had to figure out, well, how do we package these? You know, if you've ever bought marshmallows, they're probably, they've probably been in a clear plastic bag. Um, and, you know, that's really not the experience that, that we wanted. That doesn't really communicate value. Uh, so we tried to figure out with them, how would we do this? And we came up with the idea of bringing people alongside us who care just as much about the delivery of message as we do about the quality of marshmallows. So we... Uh, looked for a letterpress shop that could handle something we needed to print. And the boxes um, that are right over there, they're, they're not that large, but when, you know, when the, it's flat, it's much larger. Um, and there just aren't that many people who have the quality letterpress that can handle that size print anywhere. So they helped direct us to this company in Minneapolis, Studio on Fire, who um, just do remarkable work. And so they helped us go through this process of paper selection. We use French paper. Um, it's actually duplexed. I'll show you at the end. I'll open one up and, and you can see the inside. So we have pop tone papers on the inside, duplexed to this Madero beach on the outside. Um, you know, French paper is one of the best paper companies in America. Um, they care about making paper as much as Studio and Fire cares about printing, as much as heads of state care about design and communication, as much as we care about marshmallows. And so to us, that was really the only way we could adequately communicate how important it was uh, to us for you to go buy a box of marshmallows, which I would encourage all of you to do at some point. And so if preparation communicates value, you end up with boxes that are slightly washed out by the sunlight. Um, but in reality, which you can see they're right over there, um, they do something. And it's been awesome. On, on the times when I go lurk at places that sell our marshmallows, which I do, I just kind of stand there and try to blend in my red pants against white walls. It doesn't really actually work all that well. Uh, but when I've gone and done that and watched people at these spaces, it's really uh, a fascinating experience. People walk in, obviously, for some transaction that's not buying my marshmallows. And they stop. And I actually saw it this morning. They stop and they, they pick up the box and they touch the box and they hold the box. You know, it's, it's letterpressed, it, it has a tactile sensation to it. it, it feels good, there's heft, it feels like something real. And if we hadn't prepared adequately, if we didn't instill the value in the packaging, that would never happen. And you know, it's really impossible at a retail space to buy something that you don't touch first. So if we can get you to pick up the box, there's a good chance that we can get you to buy the marshmallow. Um, but if, man, if you don't pick it up, you're never gonna buy it. So it's been such an encouraging thing for us because we, we did this on the hope that it would work. It's been so awesome to watch how many people, in fact, do respond to that, do say, man, this is a thing that I want in my hands. And if I want to hold it, I probably want to eat it. And then if I'm going to want to eat it, I'm probably going to buy it, um, which is a big win for us, as you can imagine. Um, secondly, if you're uh, telling a story, you have to remember people want to be a part of something. Um, that's really huge. We saw this recently. We did a Kickstarter uh, to help open our magical marshmallow workshop. Uh, it's a space where we can cook marshmallows. Uh, we're hoping to be able to, to make millions a year. And we did a Kickstarter to help make that happen. And what was so cool is how we could see that people were responding, not just because they wanted as the reward marshmallows, though I think they did, but because they were really hooked into the idea of, of Wonder Maid. They were hooked into the idea of um, this little bit of magic going into marshmallows that made for this social experience that was awesome, that was fun, that was um, transformational. And yeah, I, I know I'm talking about marshmallows, but for just a split second, man, there, you know, it's, it's an experience unlike any other. And people really want to be a part of that. And that's, I mean, that's the the magic of Kickstarter. You know, when uh, it's not quite the same thing, but um, I kept thinking it, it's almost affinity sales. There are certain elements of it that remind me of when I joined um, a fan club from my favorite band, um, because I loved what they did and I wanted to support them in every which way I, I could. And you know, we see that with other brands all the time, but 
you have a capacity to instill into people um, value that they will want to be a part of. Uh, and you know, I know Croy is doing a, a Kickstarter right now for Pocket, so you should go check that out. Anybody else in here doing a Kickstarter right now that I should look at later? Um, you know, it's just a great way to tell people, here's a thing that I love that you can be a part of. And more than just the Kickstarter, that's the thing that you can always be doing. Uh, whether it's design, when I had a design shop, we always tried to um, get people excited about us. Um, but you can do that about anything. We try to do that about marshmallows. Hopefully you guys walk out of here um, excited about them. Uh, and thirdly, you gotta give your story away. Many of you probably, like me, own a, a pair of Tom's shoes. Um, I've always found them fascinating because on the surface, yeah, there you go. On the surface, if you said, hey, here's a pair of bedroom slippers, go wear them out in public all the time, <clears throat> I'd probably say, I, I'm not so sure about that. But man, when you say, hey, your shoes, buy shoes for a kid who needs them, I'm like, man, I can do that. And not only can I do that, but now when I wear them, I can tell you what I'm doing. I can make their story my own. Now, we, we tried, you know, we can't, we, we can't come up with a slogan quite as pithy as one for one yet, um, quite as exceptional as that that we've tried. Um, I mean, you know, we have in our packaging, fun to eat, fun to share, made with 100% sweet magic air. But we realize it's not just a, a slogan, it's not just a saying that does that, it's the whole experience. In fact, for Tom's, it, it actually is useful, the, the shoes that they have, that actually does help communicate part of that story and help give it away. So we thought, man, how do we, how do we set up Wonder Maid in a way that we can give away our story so that it can become your story? And what we realized is that has to do with the flavors that we sell. You know, we don't sell vanilla marshmallows. There's a reason for that, because no one is ever going to get jazzed about gourmet vanilla marshmallows. I don't get that excited about it, and I'm a marshmallow guy. Um, but we make Guinness marshmallows, beer marshmallows. They're rolled in pretzels. And let me tell you, if you're the guy who introduces your friends to Guinness marshmallows, that's a big win. Um, we make bourbon marshmallows. We use Maker's Mark with them. Uh, you know, these are things that radically, I think, reorient people's conception of what a marshmallow is. It helps take them from a thing that can only be liked to a thing that, man, I, maybe I could love that. And so we put them in boxes that you're going to love to hold, boxes you're going to love to give to people with flavors that you're going to want to be the person that introduces to the people around you in life. Uh, we've tried to come up with this exceptional taste narrative so that our story can be one that can be your story, so that you can give us away. Um, and hopefully we succeed in that um, because if not then all we'll ever be able to do is what I can communicate which would be a bummer um, so you know I, I called this marshmallow a love story and, and clearly, clearly I did that for three reasons in part because it started with me loving my wife and giving her a present that turned into something more and then because marshmallows have become something that I love uh, they were something that I liked um, that Wonder Maid marshmallows, I'm biased, granted, are something that I truly love now. And then thirdly, because what's been so exhilarating for us is that we continually have heard from people that they love Wonder Maid, that they love these marshmallows, that they love this experience. And that's really what we're aiming for. You know, I was a big Harry Potter fan. Um, I thought about dressing like him and it didn't seem appropriate or timely, so I didn't. But, you know, I remember when I read that final book um, that I came across a line in the book that um, was also in a book that a lot of other people love, um, which is the Bible, and that is actually really apropos for something all of us do, regardless of our religious orientation, um, which is where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I think it's so critical because what I'm really talking about is how to foster love. Uh, not just sell a marshmallow, but I get that when I sell a marshmallow, you have parted with part of your treasure to me. And in doing so, you have deposited a little bit of your heart with us. And that is a sacred trust that we always want to respect, that we always want to return back to people. And the deal is if we miss that, um, then all we're going to be doing is selling marshmallows as a commodity. And then all we'd be is a more expensive version of jet puffed marshmallows. Um, so for us, the question of how to sell marshmallows, and the reason it's a love story is because we realize that we're, what we're dealing with is ultimately people's hearts. Um, and again, I know I'm just talking about marshmallows, and this sounds probably pretty lofty for that. Uh, 
But you know, on, on the face of it, if you told me that I would be in love with a smartphone, um, you know, I, I would look at you kind of funny. Uh, so that's our ultimate aim. Uh, we want to be people that are good stewards of hearts by delivering excellent marshmallows. Uh, and that's what I think we've been trying to do to point, and that's what I hope we continue to do in the past. Um, so I'm so thankful that you were here uh, this morning, and I think we're going to do a Q&A section. And then afterwards, I've actually brought marshmallows. I'm going to try to convert you all. Uh, and, and they're right there, and we're going to eat them together, and I'm going to toast them if you want, or you can put them in coffee if there's any left. And I can see if I can make you people who love marshmallows. So thank you, and... Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. I have not fully transitioned. That's that's the short answer of it. You know, and and uh, and it's a great question. Really, anytime there's something that you want to do, um, you can either wholesale stop, or you can figure out a way to adjust your life so that you can start doing that. And that's what we've done. I have shut down so many other things that I was doing in order to uh, free up the time to do this. And we just made the commitment early on that we wouldn't take any money for ourselves for a couple of years because we knew it was going to take a year to do research and that it would take us a year to get to a place where there was even money. But we'd prefer to put that back into it. We didn't want to sacrifice quality, either of the goods or of the, the delivery. And that was really the only way we could make it happen, which is a, a huge bummer <laughs> on one side. Um, but it's also liberating because there's never a point in which we have to say, did we n make enough money yet, and thus are we forced to compromise um, doing it the right way in order to um, have dinner tonight. How much money have you into Well, it's not a million. Um, you know, uh, you know it's, it's been a five-figure, solid five-figure uh, to get us here, but we have hit a place where there is, I mean, we're self-sufficient. Um, but you know, boxes are expensive. Um, very expensive. Yeah, and they're not necessarily expensive when you go buy one, but you can't, I can't buy one box. So if I want to sell you one box of marshmallows, I've got to buy a whole lot more boxes to sell that first one. And you know, ditto on the branding and ditto on all the process. There, there, there is a built-in um, cost. And then there's also the life cost of all the other things you're willing to put on Pause. And there are certainly, I mean, it's been a bootstrapped process for us over time that took a lot of advanced planning. But, but uh, it, you know, there hasn't been a single time where I've thought, man, I wish I had that money back. Um, but there have been a lot of times that I've thought, I'm, this is some of the best spent time and effort um, and resources. No, you know, honestly, I would prefer the only people who invest in it be us and the people who buy our marshmallows. Um, I mean, I don't have anything against investors, um, but uh, there's a certain diligence and care with the way we spend that comes when it's um, more finite. With investors, there's always a possibility I could just go get another round of investors. Um, that's not the reality, but it's always the perceived possibility. Yeah, you know, we, uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, how are we trying to break into a market that doesn't exist? Uh, I think we're viewing that more as a possibility. I mean, that's part of the reason we have these alcohol flavors, this Guinness and this bourbon, because otherwise we'd be trying to sell expensive kids candy, um, which is a difficult thing. But the great thing is um, we don't need 100% of the people in the world to love our marshmallows. Uh, we don't even need 1%. We'd be happy with a half a percent um, or something much less than that. Uh, so, you know, for us, what we find is, honestly, the, if somebody eats one, there's a good chance that they're going to want to tell their friends. And if they own a store or a retail space and they have one, especially if they start with the box in their hand, there's a good chance they're going to want to stock it. And that's what we found, that as we find these people who have places where they could buy into the vision in that, not just advocational, but also by carrying us and promoting us and selling our products, that uh, a healthy percentage of them are willing to say, you know what, that is a market that could exist. And, um, you know, there's a lot more room for us 
in uh, a market that's currently empty. Uh, you know, if we were to do high-end chocolates, which are amazing, I'm a huge fan of great chocolate, um, man, there's a lot of people we'd have to fight against. Um, so yeah, there, there's a, there's a trade-off in that, but. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, can we maintain that passion and that commitment to quality as we go on? Um, we, on the front end, did all the boring business stuff, too. You know, we have our COGS worksheets, and we know how much every box costs us and how much every component from labor to the stickers to the bags that the marshmallows go in and the sugar. And so we did all of our due diligence along the way. I mean, passion that is unmoored from reality um, causes a lot of problems. Uh, and so we've tried to be honest and um, realistic along that way. I mean, we, we've tried to have, you know, it's a, it's a difference between a, a first date and a marriage, you know? Uh, rarely do you find someone who immediately goes from one to the other, uh, though it d does happen. Um, so for us, we had this idea, and then we spent a lot of time making sure that it could be more than just an idea, so that, like you, like you asked, so that right now where we are, we can continue to do things the right way. Um, because uh, if not, you know, we, this would be a colossal flame out, which still could be, I suppose. Uh, we're certainly hoping it's not. But yeah, what we've done is fully scalable. Um, we have all of our employee costs factored in. Even if we are making them right now, if we needed to bring people on to scale up for huge orders, all that is hopefully uh, accounted for. I'm sure we've missed something. I don't want to. Um, I don't want to be naive to say that we've covered all of our bases, but we certainly tried to cover all those nuts and bolts along the way. Do you have favorite flavors? Oh, man. Do I have favorite flavors? I'm that guy that loves everything. Seriously, like, I'll go out for dinner, and I will eat something, and I'll be like, oh, my gosh, this was the best thing I've ever had. And then the next night, I'm like, oh, man, this thing was incredible, too. So my favorite flavor is usually the one that I'm eating right now. Um, uh, you know, I really like, I haven't had it in a while. We rotate our flavors seasonally. So um, in the winter, uh, in December, we'll add our winter line, uh, complete with a runway show and everything. And, uh, and we'll have almond back. And I think almond might be my favorite, but I'm working off memory here. It's kind of like vanilla, except for it's like vanilla's cooler, older brother that has, you know, uh, a dark side, if you will, um, in a marshmallow. Uh, but yeah, I really like... Um, the almond, but really, I, you know, if there wasn't one that could be my favorite, I don't think we, I don't think we would sell that one. Um, that's kind of the bar. If I don't go crazy over it, um, then why are we selling it? So. Yeah, we do, and uh, we're asking people to lean into us a little bit. I think when we do that. Uh, you know, the best we can do is try to create um, a web environment that offers that same respect, which is really difficult because, uh, you know, if you touch your screen, it's glass. Uh, I haven't figured out a way to have that impression yet. Um, but, you know, we try to build a site that, uh, you know, our website's responsive and it's aesthetically attractive and it, uh, hopefully we respect people the same way we do there that we do here that um, we do when you actually eat the marshmallow. Um, yeah, you know, we, uh, we have found a fair number of people who buy from us once, whether it's in a store or it's online, do buy a second time. Um, we have a fairly high um, conversion rate, and fairly low attrition rate as far as things goes. Um, uh, but yeah, it's definitely a, diff a different thing. What we have found out is that people are slightly excited um, to order them online, you know, no matter how they get there, even if it's a... Um, they just land there, they stumble, and they're like, yeah, you know, it's worth me trying $15 for this. Um, they do, that reorder is fast. I mean, we had a guy who um, ordered them, bought them, or bought them online, got them delivered, and called us within 15 minutes. How fast can you guys get me 20 boxes? Can you get them tomorrow morning? Um, because I have a board meeting, and I want everyone on the board to have a box of marshmallows. Um, so, you know, we have a fair amount of people who, as soon as, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an elevation of experience. So if they like us on the web, they're going to love it 
They're going to love us when they actually get the box and eat the marshmallow. Hopefully. Yeah, there's a, yeah, there's a certain pain point. You know, it's, um, it's also been encouraging to us how often we've heard of people who buy them and then park the box on their desk and it lives there. Um, you know, we, we actually, that was sort of intentional. Uh, you know, there are certain packaging things. I remember, the, the, you know, one of the first Apple devices that I bought, that box was used for things in my house. Then I bought another Apple thing, and that box became used for things in my house. And at one point, I had like 15 different Apple boxes storing various stationery and things like that. So they are pretty. It actually gets prettier when you open them. Um, and then you don't have to throw the box away if you don't want to. How long will they keep in the box? Yeah, that's a great question. The marshmallows have about a six-week shelf life, which is actually something we have. Um, you know, it took a long time to figure out how to have shelf life that was excellent. The ingredients, as far as ingredients go, there are two ways you could, you could sweeten things. You can use corn syrup um, or you can use sugar. But in order to do sugar, you have to invert it, which is a cooking process that has the unfortunate side effect. Although it tastes much better, it leaves a much better aftertaste, better mouthfeel. The downside is sometime around seven weeks after you cook them, it, the sugar starts to granulate again. So, you know, if you've eaten a marshmallow, you know it's kind of like a smooth taste. Corn syrup will taste smooth for a year. Um, I've had those cheap marshmallows in my pantry for a year, and they get stale, but they don't ever get granulated. Um, whereas the sugar will start to revert back. So, so six weeks, they are the same. They're, they're perfect. And then sometime in that seventh week um, is when you'll start to get that, which is it's tricky for us, but most of the time people sell out of whatever they have in their stores within about a week. So it hasn't been a problem. Can you just tell us a little bit about the process of finding and choosing the branding for the event? Yeah. Yeah, you know, it, it, um, uh, I tend to lean into Providence a lot. So uh, the, the question we ask ourselves is who is the best? You know, if we can only ask one company, if we can only hire one company, if we had a million dollars, who would we hire? And then we ended up thinking, heads of state. So we said, hey, we don't have a million dollars, but if we did, I'd be making this phone call anyways. Can you help us anyways? Um, and, and they were able to do an incredible job for us. So we didn't actually vet a ton of people. We just started with, man, who's the best we could do? And then with the printing, um, we, uh, we decided with them we wanted to do boxes, which drastically winnowed the field down. And then we decided we wanted to do letterpress, which further reduced it. You know, we could have done offset. Um, we could have done, uh, you know, screen printing. Um, we could have done digital, um, which we actually did a test on digital um, for the printing. But, you know, we came up with our own dies. Um, I spent an inordinate amount of time cutting paper, trying to figure out which, what type of box do we want it front open? Do we want it, um, do we want glue? There's no glue in this. It just folds down, which is a huge thing for our efficiency of fulfillment. Um, it saves us uh, 10, 15 seconds per box, um, which adds up. And, uh, and so because we were doing letterpress boxes these size, there were really only a couple of companies. We called a lot of letterpress shops to price that out. But there were really only um, three or four that had the equipment that could do it and that had the experience to know how to do it on the equipment. Um, and uh, heads of state had worked with Studio on Fire before. They have an incredible relationship. I have a friend who's an art director at Target who had worked with them before. And so there were a lot of people I could ask and by way of reference know. So, you know, it was a little scary. I didn't do a press check. I didn't fly up to Minneapolis to see these things. So I paid them a lot of money and then I got boxes. And in between, there was a whole lot of hand wringing. Um, and then, you know, they sent me a couple of samples, one color, just so we could pick impression depth and, and things like that. Um, but, uh, it, you know, a lot of legwork and a lot of trust. Um, and, you know, that's the deal. If you, you, gotta, you have to bring people alongside you who you can trust because you can't do everything. If you do, you'll never do anything. Um, so we just found people who we could trust and we could um, still be very in involved. And I'm an incredibly annoying client. If I ever come to you, um, be wary. 
uh, because I'm really particular about everything. I, I just want it done perfectly. And um, I, I warned both of them in advance, and, and I was good to my word, um, but they totally fulfilled that trust. Um, so that's how, we, that's how we picked them. We just really, we aimed for the top both ways around. And I gotta say, too, on cost, um, if, if you're talking about volume and you're talking about doing them this way, the, the cost is actually um, not that much different than doing offset. Um, so if you're gonna do a paper box, you can do letterpress or you could go offset and you're not gonna, and even digital was about the same cost, which we just found absolutely fascinating. If you're at large enough volume that you can, you know, doing it the right way doesn't always cost more on the production side of things. You know, it adds up and you end up having to charge for that, um, but, you know, we're not afraid of charging what something should cost if it's, if it's worth it. How do you make a marshmallow? That's a great question. Uh, it's heat, sugar, water, gelatin, uh, mixing, and time. So you cook things really hot. It's a really precise temperature. You know, we've got uh, really great thermometers that beep at us when we need to pay a lot of attention and watch. Because if you go too far, you end up uh, with hard candy. And if you don't go far enough, you end up with uh, liquid, which is a drag. Um, and then you just mix it, and then you let it cure for a couple of days in pans. You cut the pans down into squares. Our marshmallows are squares. Again, another just um, visual cue that this is different um, and hopefully better different. Um, but yeah, it, it takes, uh, uh, first it takes a year and a half, and then it takes uh, about an hour to cook and mix a batch, um, which you can do concurrent batches at the same time, which is key. Um, maybe, maybe not an hour, and then they have to cure for a couple of days, and then you have to cut them and all that what stuff. Uh, we, the size we do it, you know, the trick with, with everything is if you scale up too, too much, you can't have the um, consistency of quality throughout your whole batch, and that gets you into trouble. So um, right now what we're comfortable with is we, we cook per batch, we get about 200 marshmallows. Here's a small batch of marshmallows. Yeah, small batch artisan marshmallows. Um, and we, we could probably double that, um, but we want to make sure, because again, we have, we have staff, we have people who help us do this. And so we have to make sure not just that we can pay enough attention, but that they can pay enough attention. Because they love it, but they may not love it the same way. I'm, actually, they don't love it the same way. So you know, that'll be one of our next steps, is equipment shifting so that we can do slightly larger batches. If we know that they can, um, that anyone with enough love and care uh, can do it right. One more, and then we gotta go. Great. I was just gonna ask how you chose the name and the logo. You know, that's a great question. Um, I I used to, you know, online handles. People have names that they use because you can't get your own name. I used to do Fat Dumb Guy because it was always open. Uh, but then in <laughs> yeah, nobody ever picked it. But then in professional settings, uh, slightly awkward. Oh yeah, you know, just I am me at Fat Dumb Guy. I'm like ah, oh, I gotta do something better. So I um, I was trying to figure out something and. Uh, and I don't know, it just came to me, you know, uh, really in the Bible it says we're fearfully and wonderfully made, and that always resonated with me, that every person is made with wonder. Um, and made with wonder was too long, I flipped it, wonder made. I used it for myself for years, we wanted to do marshmallows. Man, I tried so many company names, and the whole time, my wife was just like, yeah, I think we should just use wonder made. I'm like, no, 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 we'll come up with something better, like awesome mallows. And none of those things were at all better. Uh, so we landed with Wonder Maid. Um, we love it for two reasons. One, because we just think it's a statement of uh, intent and delivery. It says way more than uh, five minutes of me talking could say. Uh, and also because it, it, you know, it just sets a, a high bar for us always. You know, if we do junky marshmallows, you're going to want to punch me if I've named it Wonder Maid. I'd be that guy. And I don't ever want to be that guy. Uh, and then the extension of it, we actually came to heads of state saying hot air balloon. Um, there's just something about the practical whim that go together and, and that you're on a journey, we're on a, a journey of taste exploration. Um, so we brought those two components with them. That's part of what made it attractive to them in the first place, part of the reason they wanted to do this project. And then they killed it. You know, they just did a great job. So, so great. Thank you.